You know, on Sunday morning, I uh, <clears throat> I like to get up and I like to start the day off without any anxiety or any problems, you know. And, and I was so thankful for the rain last night, but when I went to get in my car, I had left the roof sunroof open all night. <laughs> <laughs> and right in the middle, I, I have a uh, thing that you put cups and everything. It's just full of water, you know. But, and the seat was all wet and I sat in it, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Two scripture readings, one in Psalm 32 and the other one in Psalm 51. Both these are written by David was the king of Israel. Psalm 32, <clears throat> one through five. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man <clears throat> whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and whose spirit <clears throat> there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. And then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave me the guilt of my sin. In Psalm 51, one through four. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Let us pray. <coughs> Gracious Father, we thank you for always loving us no matter where we're at in our life. Sometimes you can get angry at us, as your word tells us, but your love is always there. And whenever we turn to you, your arms are always open. And so we ask you, Father, to help us to grasp this anew this morning as we consider these two psalms written by man very much like ourselves. So we commit this time to you, Father, and give you the thanks in Christ's name, amen. Um, <clears throat> the story is told that a fellow by the name of Noel, Noel Coward, he was a well-known playwright in England and as a prank one day, he sent an identical anonymous letter to 10 very notable, notable men in, in London. And the note read, <clears throat> we know what you have done. If you don't want to be exposed, leave town. Within six months, all 10 men left town. A research project that was done in 1991 at the Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio, they found out that the average person spends approximately two hours a day feeling guilty. Two hours every day. The title of our sermon this morning is, What Do You Do With Guilt? When we sin against one another and hurt one another, it's a matter of going to that one whom we've hurt and telling them how sorry we are and asking for their forgiveness. And if they forgive us, then some wonderful healing takes place in both lives. But what about when you've sinned against God? What, what then? A sin committed out of ignorance, perhaps? A sin committed in a weak moment in your life? A 
sin committed out of fear as a quick solution for a problem that you're facing? Or perhaps a sin committed under the pressure from others around you who were older and wiser, at least so you thought. What do you do about sins like this? What do you do about a sin that because of its seriousness it weighs upon your heart day in and day out? In Psalm 51, King David cries out in the third verse, I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Tranquilizers won't help here for they, they wear off. Rationalization won't help here for the mind knows when it's being duped. And all the therapy in the world won't help here. For like a record that has a scratch on it, our sin keeps on accusing us over and over again. David's problem was that he had committed one sin that then led to another sin. A greater sin, if you will. The sin of taking the life of an innocent person. Now, David didn't personally take the life of this innocent person. In fact, his hands never touched him. But nevertheless, he was the mastermind behind it. After David committed that first sin that led to the second sin, he found himself in a very awkward position, especially since earlier God had said to him, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will be their king. That is, David, I have chosen you to be the spiritual leader of my people. I've chosen you to model the spiritual life before the nation of Israel. Now, David's first sin took place one warm spring evening towards dusk. It's one of those beautiful evenings like we've had the last few days. One of those evenings that makes you feel good that you're alive. David had left his room to take a walk on the upper terrace of his palace. And coming to the edge of the terrace, he noticed something going on down below, on the terrace below from where he was standing. A beautiful woman was bathing. Limb by limb, she was lathering her body and washing it ever so gently. Her name was Bathsheba. And instead of putting to death the rush of lust that welled up inside of him, as the Apostle Paul tells us that we need to do in situations like this, David instead nurtured that lust. That is, he, he fed that rush of lust by fastening his eyes on her body until finally he felt that he had to have her. Unknowingly, he had now given the devil a foothold in his life, which the Apostle Paul warns us about not doing. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand against the devil's schemes. Well, David, being a warrior on the battlefield, he neglected to put on the full armor of God on this day that evil came knocking at his door. This day when he was severely tempted by the evil one. As king, of course, he was able to arrange for her to be brought up to his chambers where he ended up making love with her. This, as God would have it, resulted in her becoming pregnant. David now had a real problem, a big problem, a huge problem. For Bathsheba was married to a man by the name of Uriah. Uriah was an officer in David's army. And so looking for a quick solution to his problem, David called Uriah home from the battlefield for a time of refreshment. 
And when he got home, David encouraged him to refresh himself by spending time with his wife, Bathsheba. Uriah, however, said to David, the ark in Israel are, and Judah are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open fields. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Now this attitude on Uriah's part, as noble as it was, now created a real dilemma for David. What was he going to do? He now had to come up with a, another solution, another plan, plan B, if you will. And after a sleepless night and an anxiety-filled night, I suspect, when he woke up in the morning, he decided to write a letter to Uriah's commanding officer, General Johab. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 4, we have a record of that letter. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, Put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is the fierce, fiercest. Then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. Well, plan B worked out perfectly. Uriah was killed in battle. And after a time of mourning, David took Bathsheba as his own wife. Now, at first, I'm sure he felt like he had gotten out of a difficult situation without any consequences. 2 Samuel 11:27, however, gives us a chilling footnote. It reads, But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. How many times have you felt that way? The thing you have done has displeased the Lord. Guilt, as Dr. James Dobson writes, is a message from the conscience which says, in effect, you should be ashamed of yourself. For our purposes this morning, I'd like to say that guilt is a message not from our conscience, but from God himself that says you should be ashamed of yourself. For about a year, David tried to forget what he had done. For a year, he tried to ignore that inner voice from God. For about a year, he tried to ignore the feelings of shame and guilt. For after all, it wasn't his spear that pierced Uriah's heart. For a year, he pretended that he had done no wrong. But God would not let David forget, just like he won't let you forget when you sin against him. He loves you too much to let you forget, just like he loved David too much to let him forget. Day in and day out, guilt gnawed at David's heart until finally we hear him crying out in the 51st Psalm, my sin is always before me. Against you and only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. In Psalm 32, David describes it like this. For day and night your hand, O Lord, was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. This was David's moment of truth. This was that moment when David's life in David's life when all pretending had to cease. This was that moment in David's life when the rubber met the cement, if you will. For David, the words of the prophet Isaiah had now found their mark. Those who sin against God are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the one who is guilty before me. A secular psychology tells us that guilt is a powerful emotion that drains our energy. If unchecked, they tell us it will end up destroying us for it will grow and grow like, like, like weeds filling a garden until all that is good and useful is choked out. 
Now, as true as this may be, there is a positive side to guilt. A side that, as we have suggested, involves the handiwork of God. You see, in many ways, guilt is like that smoke alarm in your home. When that smoke alarm goes off, there's an irritating noise that causes you to see what's wrong. The purpose of the smoke alarm is for the protection of your physical life. In a similar way, God in his love for you has designed guilt to be an alarm that protects your spiritual life. As irritating as the voice of guilt may be, it alerts you to the fact that something is wrong in your spiritual life. Hard as it may be to accept, guilt is an internal voice reminding you that you have messed up and that something is wrong between you and God. You see, God values his fellowship with you too much to allow it to be destroyed by some unchecked sin. Now, unfortunately, many people in an attempt to get rid of this internal voice of guilt, they have dealt with it in some very destructive ways. Most try to stuff it. That is, they, they try to repress those feelings of guilt. And King David did this for a while. It nearly drove him crazy. For as he writes in the 32nd Psalm, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Our psychiatric hospitals are filled with people who have tried to repress feelings of guilt. People who have, who have not grasped the immensity of God's forgiveness. And of course, the ultimate unbiblical way of dealing with that irritating voice of guilt is to silence it by means of taking one's own life. This is the route that Judas took. When the chief priests were looking for a way to capture Jesus, a bargain was struck between them and Judas. For 30 pieces of silver, Judas agreed to portray his Lord by a kiss. After this diabolical scheme was carried out, Judas experienced unbearable guilt. And going back to the chief priest, he threw those 30 pieces of silver on the temple floor and he cried out, I have sinned by portraying innocent blood. And then he went out and he hung himself. Judas did not grasp the immensity of God's forgiveness. Judas did not grasp the immensity of God's love for him. Now in contrast to Judas, David did grasp the immensity of God's forgiveness. David did grasp the immensity of God's love. David did grasp the immensity of God's desire to restore fellowship with him. And because he did in that moment of truth when he was willing to admit that he had sinned against God, he cries out to God in the 51st Psalm, against you and only you have I done what is evil in your sight. Or as he puts it in Psalm 32, then I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. The Apostle John, who understood what David was talking about, he writes in his epistle, if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, our Bibles use an interesting word in connection with the forgiveness of God. It's the word atonement. Atonement means literally to cover. It's the same Hebrew word translated coat in Genesis where God instructs Noah on how to build the ark. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. 
When you come to the cross with your sins, you are coated inside and out with the blood of Jesus. You are cleansed within and without from all your, all your transgressions and unrighteousness. Your garments of unrighteousness in God's eyes are removed and you are then clothed with the garments of Christ's righteousness. Clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus, Paul says to us in his letter to the church in Rome. Or as Apostle John puts it, the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. And so let me say to you, if you're tired of carrying around that weight of guilt, what are you waiting for? Why are you even hesitating? A story is told of a time many years ago when a father and his six-year-old daughter were walking through the grasses on the Canadian prairie. In the distance, they suddenly saw a prairie fire coming their way that would soon engulf them. The father knew that there was only one way to escape. They must quickly build a fire right where they were standing and burn a large patch of grass around them. And when the flames approached them, the girl was terrified, but her father assured her, the flames can't get us. We are standing where the fire has already been. At the cross, the fire has already been there. The blood of Jesus has already been poured out for your sins. And so let me ask you again, what are you waiting for? Why do you even hesitate to come to him? Don't you realize how much God of our universe desires to have fellowship with you? Don't you realize how much the God of our universe loves you? Are you not able to grasp the immensity of his forgiveness? Are you not able to grasp the immensity of his love for you? Let us pray. Gracious Father, we come to you with much thanksgiving in our heart. We know that when we have messed, messed up, that you're always there with your arms ready to receive us back. But we need to take the step. We need to come to you and confess our sins. And you will wash those sins away just like that. You don't want us to live with the weight of guilt. You don't want it to drain our energy. You don't want it to cause us to become anxious or depressed. And so you've made this way of escape through the blood of your son. So we pray, Father, that if there is anyone here or on cable TV that is watching, that they will not hesitate to come to you, that they will realize and understand how deeply, deeply you love each one. So we ask you, Father, to bless, to guide, and to motivate those that need to come to you to do so soon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.